Great, okay, I'm gonna get started. Um, so hello everybody. Thank you so much for joining our IIED debates event today. Why women are footing the bill for climate uh, lessons from Bangladesh. Today's uh, event is co-hosted um, with ICAD, Kingston University and UNDP. And we're really delighted to be um, co-hosting this event all together. My uh, name is Juliet. I'm the events officer at IIED um, and I'll be providing technical support uh, as we go through the event. And with that, I am really pleased to introduce Salim Hook, who is the director of the International Centre for Climate Change and Development in Bangladesh, and who is our, our moderator for today's discussion. Salim, over to you, please. Great. Thank you very much, Juliet, and good afternoon to everybody from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, welcome to this uh, very interesting uh, discussion I hope we're going to have. Uh, just a, a quick... Um, housekeeping to let people know that if you have come into this meeting through a speaker uh, connection, uh, you need to leave it and come back through the general attendees uh, uh, um, connection. So uh, if any of you have come in as speakers uh, or using a speaker link, uh, I'd request you to kindly um, come back, leave and come back uh, through one of the attendees link. Um, it's my great pleasure to uh, be the moderator for this very interesting discussion on why women are footing the bill for climate lessons from Bangladesh. Um, I'll just mention the uh, flow of the meeting so everybody knows what to expect. We'll have a presentation on this very interesting new publication that has now just gone live and in fact has been picked up by significant numbers of uh, uh, press as well already. Uh, we'll have a presentation on it by Sheikh Eskander, who is one of the key authors. Uh, and then we will have comments on that presentation uh, from Anne uh, Kuriakosa uh, from the World Bank and Maliha Muzammil from UNDP. And then we will open up for a Q&A from uh, the audience. And I would request, as Julia has said, that if you have questions, put them in the question box um, and we'll try and address them either written or oral. Or uh, if you have comments and want to introduce yourself, then use the chat box uh, to do that. And if you want to share any materials, feel free to do that in the chat box. So we hope that the chat box can be used for some lively uh, discussion and the Q&A box for questions to the, uh, the speaker and the panelists. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to go to our first um, poll, uh, which we are going to do. We're going to do two polls. Uh, during this uh, study uh, or this uh, webinar or discussion. Uh, the first one we are going to put to you now, which is a question on how much do you think women are actually spending uh, to tackle climate change? There's a nice question here on, would it be easier if was implied by expenditure is explained a little bit more. I, I hope Iskander can take that question in his presentation. Shall we have a look at the results, Juliet? Yes, hopefully you can see them. I've just shared them now. Yep. Okay, so we've got a plurality of 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and then the next one is less than 10 percent. And then I think 30 to 40 and 30 or 30 to 40 seem to be given twice. So that's at 18 percent. Uh, and uh, the lowest number at 10 percent is 10 to 20 percent. Okay, so. Let me let me hand over to um, Sheikh Iskander. Introduce him first. He's a a, a young Bangladeshi uh, researcher currently based in the UK at the uh, Kingston University uh, in London. He's a, a senior lecturer and assistant professor of economics at Kingston University, and also a visiting research fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science, based in London in the UK. Who was the principal um, person uh, uh, investigator in this? Uh, uh, study. And uh, I will hand over to you, Sheikh, to both present your work, but also answer uh, the uh, the question of which one is correct and uh, um, and then take us through your presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Salim. Thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, uh, today. So I would like to go with the majority of respondents uh, from the back of my head, I'm a bit unsure exactly what the exact answer is. 
is it uh, Paul? Is it twenty to thirty or slightly more? It's thirty to forty. Thirty to forty, actually, just over thirty. So yeah, so the, here, here's the thing. You know, we are always a bit confused exactly how much we, and especially people who are socio-economically disadvantaged are burdened with the exposure to repeated disaster events. Even you just can see from my response there, I am one of the uh, authors of this report and immediately got confused. Is it the right answer? Or am I saying, say, these people are actually not spending that much? And this is widely perceived uh, thing and a confusing thing when we, uh, on the basis of our research, come up with a figure, which is definitely a robust estimate that this is the figure or this is the percentage of their income or expenditure they are dedicating in uh, uh, to recover from disaster exposure and related risks. Now that's the background and also the result, one of the results uh, we came up with from this uh, really important study. We looked at exactly how poor uh, women in rural Bangladesh are still bearing a significant burden of total disaster risk reduction and management. In doing so, uh, Juliet, can we uh, move to next slide? Uh, next one. We set up a couple of um, simple, direct, and really important research objectives like identifying adaptation exp expenditure and calculating them for rural Bangladeshi households and identifying the socioeconomic factors that are influencing disaster and climate adaptation expenditure that those households are uh, incurring. And then to put it into more context, exactly what's the share of income they are dedicating in disaster and climate expenditure related uh, things. And if we already know, it, there are some gender differences, but we wanted to identify using actual data from the field, what's the gender difference in disaster climate adaptation expenditure. To do so, uh, next slide, please. We conducted a survey on slightly more than 3,000 households from 10 selected districts. And in selecting those 10 districts, we kept in our mind that uh, we had a monsoon flood and also a cyclone amphan affecting different regions of Bangladesh. So what we did, we selected some flood affected, some storm affected, and some unaffected uh, districts to create uh, treatment and control or affected and unaffected households and regions. And that actually enabled us to identify exact uh, expenditure that because of those ex exposure to flood and storm, uh, the, those households are making at this moment or maybe one or two years ago. We asked those households to recall their income and expenditure related information and also asked specifics about how much they are spending in some specific disaster recovery and risk reduction actions and then as we already mentioned, one of our objectives was to identify and calculate exactly how much they are spending in adaptation related actions. We calculated their expenditure using this. Uh, next slide, please. Key results are 
we found say households are uh, frequently getting exposed to disaster and those exposures are having some considerable impacts on their income and expenditure decisions and those impacts are more profound on female headed households uh, next one please you can see here say some visualization of different types of uh, disasters affecting our surveyed households and their breakdown by gender here you know there's not much difference when it comes to storm or other disasters which mostly include slow onset climate induced disasters like drought uh, salinity um, irregular rainfall and uh, temperature those sort of events but when it comes to flood we you can see that female headed households actually report to be uh, more exposed to flood than more male headed households next slide a bit different scenario when we look at exactly how those households are spending in uh, reducing the risk and also in recovery from those disasters you look at this i mean the storm figures actually give you a big contrast between contributions made by male and female headed households when we look at spend as percentage of annual household income or expenditure it's something like say around 40% or 41% or slightly more than 31% if we take expenditure as the measure and it's a huge percentage and when you compare it with what male headed households are spending you can immediately pick up two alternative explanations either either these female headed households have lower adaptive capacity or lower uh, income so when you are exposed to a disaster you must incur some specific expenditure and when you incur that it comes out as a huge percentage of your total income meaning those female headed households now will be cash strapped and will not be able to spend enough money in other important things like uh, feeding and educating their children and also themselves and you can't also forget healthcare expenditure and all these things are going to be affected if you have to privately spend this much share of your total income in disaster risk reduction and the other explanation can be well female headed households are uh, females by uh, custom take uh, are responsible to take care of their household their children and all these practices that are going over for thousands of year now you know they need to play their custodian role anyway and that's why they are spending a major share of their income and expenditure in reducing the risk posed on their households their children and family members by disasters like flood storm and other uh, please next slide in addition you can also see that when females actually take over household head role either i mean i'm talking about bangladesh and you need to know that this is the reality uh, females normally become household heads if there's no male members in that household either because she is a single mom or maybe 
uh, their partners or their husbands now migrated for temporary job outside. And apparently, they are also poorer households. So things I just mentioned on earlier slides explanation that we are talking about altogether the increased or heightened uh, vulnerability of females who already are burdened with taking care of their daily chores at the household. And now in the wake of a disaster, they need to do a uh, little more and need to go extra miles to keep their family safe and secure. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the policy recommendations that we can suggest in addition to, uh, you know, adopting directed support systems within uh, the government of Bangladesh's ongoing or uh, existing disaster risk reduction mechanism and supports to help these socioeconomically disadvantaged groups, including uh, female headed households. We want to highlight the need for research because once you formulate a policy to support these people, those policy must be backed up by sufficient number of research covering different aspects of climate household expenditure. So this is actually the beginning. We first talked about this, that this sort of research, research must be done in Bangladesh and many other developing country. And to mainstream this thing, we actually need to integrate the questions that we asked in this survey in national survey like uh, household income and expenditure survey which is conducted by bbs the statistical wing of government of bangladesh and donors like world bank undp they can also come up and encourage or I mean, at their capacity, they can encourage the government to include these things in national surveys. And as we definitely know that poor people need to receive support and here it's a role, not only for the government or the affected households, it's also a global political economic issue. And donors like say uh, developed countries or multilateral donors also need to play their appropriate roles in this context to prioritize the needs of poor people uh, in the wake of a disaster. So thank you, thank you. That's my presentation and yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sheikh Iskander, well done. Uh, I have a quick uh, question for you with regards to um, a bit of a technical question in terms of your methodology. Uh, how are, are you able to distinguish or what are the parameters that you use to distinguish what I will call losses and damages, which is what the people have suffered, the ones that are affected by floods or by droughts or by hurricanes, uh, and what they are then spending not just to deal with the suffering, but also to prepare themselves to not suffer again next time. So the, the latter, I would categorize as adaptation funding. They're preparing for the next time. And the former is an actual loss. They lost it. They lost their cow or they lost their house. That's a loss. That's a complete loss. Uh, are you able to distinguish between these two uh, losses versus what I would call investments for the future? Uh, thank you for this really important question. So this is a, a limitation we need to admit of our study that we did not account for all the losses the households incurred, but we investigated and calculated what they are doing to, 
you want to manage or reduce the risk. Something I can use one example. Say, if you are exposed to a flood, uh, we can uh, automatically uh, expect, say, households who expect to be repeatedly exposed to flood can raise the uh, their homestead so that their homestead doesn't get flooded once again. So this is kind of a adaptation investment. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm seeing some questions and in fact, some hands as well. Uh, I would invite everybody who has a question to put it in the Q&A uh, box and we will address them. Uh, and if you want to speak, if you have your hand up, I see uh, Francis Lawton has his hand up. I will give you the floor later on, if that's okay, when we come to the Q&A session. Uh, so I would now like to uh, ask our first of two designated uh, discussants uh, representing uh, first from the World Bank. We have Anne uh, Kuria, Kuria Kosa, I think I've pronounced that right, um, who is a development sociologist based at the World Bank South Asia region as a senior social development specialist where she coordinates gender programming and work on social dimensions of climate change. Uh, since joining the bank in 2005, Anne has led analytical work on labor, adaptation and social protection and supported operations in CDD irrigation and forestry. Uh, she led the gender program of US $8.3 billion climate investment funds at the World Bank Climate Group. And she has experience in quite a few countries, including India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, here in our region. Uh, so Anne, if you would like to just share some thoughts on particularly where does this kind of research fit into programming that you would be doing at the World Bank level, you may already be doing or planning to do, and how can we take further both the research and the programming uh, as well to address the female-headed households? And, and we all know that uh, females are much, much more vulnerable uh, than males in general. And over to you. Thank you very much, Salim, and um, thank you to IID and colleagues for the invitation to speak today. Um, I'm Ann Koriakos, uh, as was mentioned, and um, really pleased to be able to um, respond to this um, paper by uh, Sheikh Iskander, um, which um, I think problematizes uh, the question of vulnerability within the household um, uh, much more systematically than we often see in terms of uh, impacts um, uh, from climate. Uh, and I think that this um, is very much consistent with some of what we've seen before uh, in terms of um, looking at vulnerability of uh, households um, across Bangladesh. We did some work about 10 years back um, under the Economics of Adaptation to Climate Change study, which um, did see that, um, uh, particularly when we look um, socio-spatially, that there are uh, vulnerabilities um, for those regions that are hit by multiple hazards, by storms, by uh, floods, uh, droughts, uh, sea level rise, and that households aren't able to um, recover when they're hit in these um, uh, by multiple hazards um, in time. And so what you get is this kind of um, entrenched um, poverty then that becomes much more difficult um, compared to those subnational regions of Bangladesh where they might only be exposed to one hazard. Um, what we've seen here, of course, in today's paper is um, much more uh, problematizing what's happening within the household um, uh, here, distinguishing between male and female headed households um, with those very important findings around um, the, this costly burden to uh, female headed households because they're starting from a lower um, uh, income status to start with, um, and oftentimes um, segregated in, um, in natural resource-based livelihoods to an even greater extent um, than we see men who are um, often typically uh, diversified more into um, services and manufacturing, um, even in, in rural areas where we see non-farm um, participation. Um, overall, pattern-wise, we've seen that uh, the um, uh, poorest are often um, uh, pushed onto these marginalized lands. Um, so again, they have that sort of physical exposure from uh, a very weak uh, asset base. Um, if we think in Bangladesh in the case of the chores or 
um, um, some of these uh, uh, irregular settlements, um, which are very um, physically vulnerable, but also um, institutionally quite marginalized from um, the sorts of service delivery that we might expect um, uh, in other um, places. And so I think this distinction that um, Salim has made between uh, what the sort of um, ex ante uh, disaster risk reduction measures that households are taking on their own um, and individuals in this case, um, compared to some of the more productive or um, even um, um, kind of productive measures that might be taken in terms of uh, livelihoods diversification or um, uh, physical investments in um, uh, hard and soft uh, infrastructure as well in um, uh, and regions is, is important when we think about the adaptive capacity of, of, of different areas and different groups. Um, the other piece I really appreciated within this paper was, um, again, looking at, um, uh, you know, not just as gender disaggregation within the household and, and uh, spheres of kind of decision making in a sense, um, but also uh, uh, the potential for thinking about kind of co-located households. And that's question of uh, male out migration. Um, potentially, we have um, uh, you know, different uh, sources of income and, and um, uh, fallback positions in a sense where you've got um, some people within the household uh, based in, um, in cities, others uh, still back in villages, et cetera. Um, and that could be male or female in Bangladesh, of course. I mean, you still have predominantly the male out migration, but we've seen, of course, through the, the garment district employment, et cetera, um, lots of young women as well moving to, um, to cities and having a role there. When we think about um, vulnerability and um, uh, these sorts of um, uh, uh, investments in, in, in assets, as well as um, some of those uh, other measures that are protective, such as uh, skills development and um, uh, and the sort of diversification I've mentioned before. Um, this is a whole bundle of livelihood um, elements that um, that I think households are bringing together to um, protect themselves um, uh, as much as possible. Um, and what has what we found in this uh, research on the economics of adaptation to climate change is that it's, uh, you know, of course, you can't rely only on, uh, on uh, poor individuals, but what are those sorts of um, uh, other investments that can be made that make a difference? Um, I've mentioned the hard infrastructure, but of course, uh, we saw that uh, for Bangladesh, depending on the region, those areas that are very institutionally dense that have um, uh, high levels of CSO presence um, and um, the sort of uh, inbuilt um, social capital and knowledge that comes from um, preparedness measures um, that, that um, uh, households are exposed to makes a big difference. Um, and, and government of Bangladesh has also been investing heavily in this as we've seen um, with the uh, uh, disaster preparedness measures um, over time and the huge great achievements in reducing um, gender disparities in uh, morbidity and mortality um, between cyclones from 14 to one down to uh, five to one um, in, in the male female um, gap there in between cyclones, uh, Bola and, um, and Sitter as we, as we move over time. Um, so I'll just stop there and right. kind of raised a few points, but sure. um, I'm very happy in the discussion to go into some more detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, and excellent, excellent uh, inputs. We'll come back to you with some further, you know, thoughts on how to take things forward uh, with this kind of more nuanced and detailed information, so that the effectiveness of interventions can be improved uh, to reach the most vulnerable, uh, particularly women, and within women, women-headed households. Uh, so I'm now going to invite the second uh, designated discussant, who is. Uh, Maliha uh, Mozammel from the United Nations Development Program. Uh, Maliha is a, a climate finance expert at UNDP Bangladesh and a research fellow in the Environment and Society Program at Chatham House, working on key issues around climate change, food systems, and food security in a post-COVID-19 world. Her specialisms include low carbon, climate resilient development, climate policy, sustainable food systems, and equitable energy system transformations. Uh, Maliha, uh, please uh, go ahead and share your thoughts. And again, uh, as with Anne, a little bit of context for UNDP in the kinds of things that you are doing where you can take these kinds of analysis further and use them in your programming going forward. Maliha? 
Thank you, Dr. Hawk, and uh, thank you, um, Anne. I think those were very insightful comments. Um, I hope you can all hear me and uh, see yes, me. Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. I think uh, one of the most important learnings from this study and which we, we'd already been seeing in the field is the importance of, you know, like you mentioned, providing effective interventions. So providing support for diversification of livelihoods for these women. Um, when we're, you know, working at the ground level, there is no one size fits all, um, even in the same reg region, even in the same uh, union. So there, there must be uh, enough um, uh, varieties or that, that diversification that we provide um, in terms of opportunities. Um, again, in terms of the criteria for women-headed households, I've, I find this a bit uh, difficult on the ground sometimes because uh, th this needs to be flexible or wide enough to ensure that many of the women left behind who have uh, working partners in, in the cities or partners, uh, um, men who have uh, left and gone somewhere, uh, it doesn't really include them. So how can we ensure that uh, many of these women are still included? Um, Again, you know, coming out of this uh, research, I think uh, we need to ensure that uh, on the ground field, ag field agents are, there are enough on the ground field agents to provide support to ensure that any intervention uh, we provide uh, in terms of funding through UNDP or through CSOs or through other NGOs, uh, that there's someone they can reach out to and for help uh, who, who can ensure that this is effectively being implemented on the ground. Um, I guess uh, I, from uh, my experience and from what we know, uh, from, uh, supporting climate resilient housing, uh, you know, climate resilient water supplies, agricultural infrastructure, livestock is, um, you know, one of the most important um, areas uh, via which we can help them. And uh, while there is a lot of um, investment for poor, for poor um, I, I want to say a lot of um, investment that poor households makes actually go into making their housing more resilient. So um, we have also been thinking of focusing more uh, funding on climate resilient housing in these disaster prone areas or in these um, climate induced um, areas. Um, Anne already mentioned, and I'll, I'll just touch on this very briefly, that we, you know, and this, you know, we've been talking about this for ages. How can we ensure better coordination between the ministries and departments, between the funding we provide to ensure there's no duplication of efforts or no duplication of funding? And while, you know, it is easier said than done, um, how can we ensure this in, in a national level or in, in, in a regional context? How can we be a bit more effective uh, uh, in terms of this. I, and I guess, you know, one of the most important things that this paper shows is that if we are able to uh, do similar research in other least developed countries, other climate vulnerable countries, and um, it provides us with a similar result, then it has huge merit from the climate um, justice and advocacy angle. We can take it to the COP, we can take it to the donors, you know, and we can, we can tell them that, look, this is what is happening. How can you help us, um, help us justify this or how can you help how, how can you match the funds that these poor uh, vulnerable communities poor women are putting in from their pockets so uh, it, from UNDP we've been working on uh, researching gender and climate bonds we've been you know facilitating climate vulnerable poor peoples poor women's cooperatives and we've been trying to work a bit more at the ground level to ensure that um, the, those you know most at uh, at risk those most vulnerable are actually getting the help and support and the funding that they should be or that we are being provided in order to support them. Um, we're also working on a parametric risk financing where we want to use satellite Im imagery uh, to identify um, damage uh, uh, you know, after a disaster in many of these households and then compensate them accordingly. Um, we, we, on the side, we also have uh, ongoing research on insurance instruments, and I think this is very new and innovative, so we're looking at both disaster risk financing and climate um, insurance, climate risk financing, and trying to ensure that uh, we, we understand how to keep these separate and compensate these people uh, who are the most vulnerable so that they can use their resources uh, more strategically. I think uh, lastly, you know, what we want to ensure is that development co benefits from climate finance is uh, maximized. And uh, research uh, such as these can only help us, you know, um, strengthen our voices and ask the donors to match the funds that are already being spent by these most vulnerable people. 
Um, I, just to mention, at the policy level, we're also looking at um, innovative climate uh, financing options, and we're doing a lot of work on accountability and transparency. So we're working with various ministries. We're going to have a, a, a training very soon with uh, the ministries of finance of various um, Asia-Pacific countries. Uh, so that uh, we were training them so that they can do their climate performance audit. So these are, this is just an example of something we're doing at, at the uh, policy level. Um, so that's it for, for me for now. Thank you very much. Greg, thank you very much, uh, Maliha, for those excellent uh, contributions and particularly pointing out things that are uh, already being uh, addressed and developed and, and hopefully can be taken uh, forward. Um, now we are going to segue in a minute or two uh, to the Q&A uh, uh, part of this uh, meeting. But before we do that, we have one more uh, poll uh, to share with all the participants to uh, answer a question, which is why do you think female headed households spend such a large share of their expenditure on climate disaster risks? And you've only got one, one choice to make. Uh, the first one being female headed households live in areas where some climate disasters are greatest. The second one being female headed households are poorer than male headed households. And the third one being female headed households are higher demand for disaster protection investments. And fourth and finally, female headed households have less diversified income sources. Uh, please uh, tick one of them uh, that you think will be the most appropriate and submit it. And then let's see uh, uh, how we all answer. Um, in the previous case, I did know the answer. In this case, I don't know the answer. So I've, I've taken a guess myself. Let's see whose guess has come uh, through uh, properly. Also, let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, um, introduce uh, one of the co-authors of this paper, a very important co-author, Paul Steele. Paul, would you like to turn your camera on uh, and, and uh, 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 recognize that he was one of the key uh, people behind designing and, and running this study. Uh, and uh, we've been working together for many years together. It's a pleasure to have Paul. So Paul, I'm going to invite you a little later to say a few words. And in the meantime, also uh, invite you to take uh, one or two of the questions if you feel you want to do them. So when I come to the Q&A, uh, both you and Iskander and also Anne and uh, Maliha, feel free to uh, uh, offer to answer any of the questions that you feel uh, is relevant for you and you would like to contribute. Uh, Juliet, do we have uh, uh, closure on the question? Yep, ready to go. I'll share the results go now. Ahead. Okay, so number uh, four with the female headed households have less diversified income. That's what I said as well. Uh, and then we also have female headed households are poorer than male headed households. That's a reasonable assumption. And then uh, female headed households live in areas which are some climate vulnerability. That's true also. And finally, female headed households have higher demand for disaster protection. Uh, that came in only at 4%. Uh, is there an answer to this question, Juliet? Is there a correct answer? They're actually all correct, Salim. So all correct. <laughs> Good. So nobody's wrong. We're all right. <laughs> Excellent. Well done, everybody. Uh, you, you, uh, thank you for participating. We wanted to make it a, a bit more interactive than uh, these normal webinars are. Okay, so I'm now going to move us to the Q&A session. We've already got some very good questions in the question uh, answer box. I'm going to read off one at a time, a few of them. We may not, not be able to do all of them, but we'll try and do them and invite, I'll direct them to each uh, person. And then, as I said, if any of the speakers wish to pick one, let me know by putting your hand up. So the first question comes from Brian Barben, who is our uh, colleague in IID. Uh, he, he asks, if climate disaster expenditure by households, climate loss and damage based on the evidence, how are these households directly compensated for their loss? What are the mechanisms available at the local level? Uh, who would like to take that? Uh, Iskandar, do you want to take it? Uh, I, I think local level, um, you know, uh, reflection can be, can come better from Maliha or someone. So well, I'll take it. I'll take it for you. Okay. So the basically the households are on their own. All right. So whatever they lose, they lose. So 100% of the loss is their loss. The question then is to what extent do they get uh, 
additional support coming in from others. And there are basically three major sources. The first one is friends, neighbors, uh, relatives. They are the first, first recourse. We help each other. We help our neighbors. If our neighbor uh, has been affected and I can help him, I will help him. And that does happen in Bangladesh to a large extent. There's a, there's a very great amount of social capital involved in helping uh, poor people. The second level is more formal uh, support coming in from government. Government does mobilize itself, local government, national government. Uh, they come in with relief, uh, sometimes in the form of food, sometimes in the form of cash, uh, sometimes in the for form of clothing, depending on the, the hazard and the impacts that have happened. Um, and then finally, uh, a little later come the international agencies, a combination of uh, uh, the formal UN agencies and uh, NGOs like Oxfam and CARE and others, uh, of which there are many in Bangladesh, they do come in and do quite a lot as well. Uh, but they tend to be a bit slower. They tend to be coming in a little later. Um, in terms of how much uh, a poor household will actually get in the form of compensation, it varies enormously. Um, it, 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 at one end of the scale, very little. At another end of the scale, perhaps uh, more. And in fact, the challenge for all of us collectively, every one of us, is how do we improve that level of reaching the most deserving, the most vulnerable, the most affected at a more efficient way than we have done in the past. Uh, so let us uh, move on to the next question, which again, I'll read out. It comes from uh, Susan and Samuel. Uh, it says, thank you so much for this resourceful discussion. A specific question to Anne, how do you think is the pattern of social, legal, environmental movements of women in the global South? Do you think this enhances the potential for mainstreaming human rights in a holistic manner through climate action? Uh, do you think these movements can navigate the policies to a better integration? And you've been working in this area for a long time. Uh, what is your um, feeling about the opportunities for women's uh, political movements or more human rights-based movements in the global South? Thank you. Thank you for that question. The um, uh, I think there's quite a lot of scope, actually, and we've um, uh, seen different forms of uh, collective action, um, both uh, outside of uh, kind of formal government channels, but also I think um, increasingly the importance of um, women mobilizing to um, participate in informal local governance and that whole question of kind of voice and accountability um, um, matters when we're talking about uh, um, uh, climate action. And here in particular, um, uh, the bank is quite um, keen to see much more um, devolved climate finance and, and uh, um, strengthening of, of local government capacity um, uh, to respond to um, these sorts of shocks, but also help um, uh, with the diversification and area development that we've been talking about um, during this session. Uh, and our challenge has been to um, make sure that the widest um, and broadest number of um, uh, people, vulnerable groups, uh, women um, of different types, and, and we don't want to kind of uh, lump everyone together. And um, we've importantly in this paper, I think, uh, the term female headed households has been used as a useful and largely um, uh, correct proxy for uh, for the most vulnerable. Um, but we do in a lot of our um, targeting efforts around social protection and uh, uh, adaptive social protection also have um, lots of uh, kind of um, income verification and, and means testing as well, um, because uh, we don't want to have um, just that one to one uh, assumption that, that sometimes um, they have done. And so best practice coming out of our gender group in the World Bank is um, is also to kind of um, uh, open up these boxes and think of um, uh, who's actually in, in a, in a uh, most vulnerable position. Lots of times also thinking of intersectional questions, right, in terms of ethnic minorities, um, uh, elderly and, and others as well, and, and the ways that those categories intersect with um, with gender as well. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, the, the category of most vulnerable doesn't have an answer. There are many, many, many vulnerable groups, as you said, uh, women being one very large number, but others as well, indigenous and elderly and, and uh, 
uh, disabled and so on and so forth. Uh, let me move on to the next question. It's from Kirsty Mason. Uh, she asks, if women are more affected by floods than storms, but the cost of recovering from or adapting to storms is far higher, how does that translate into women paying more for climate risks? A significantly larger number of women than men lose their lives through floods in South Asia too. Who'd like to take that? Paul, any thoughts on that? Differentiation between floods and storms? Sure. I mean, there's um, a sh shake identified. We, um, in this study, we look at the cost, the how much households are spending to reduce the risks of climate related disasters. We don't actually look at the losses. So I think in a further study or studies in other countries, we would need to look at, as you indicated in your remarks on loss and damages, both the pre and post uh, expenditure. So that, in fact, that makes our numbers quite conservative. If you look at how much they're spending on pre and post, it would probably be significantly more than the 31% that female headed households are spending according to our paper. In addition to that, um, yeah. you see the fundamental difference between how flood and storms affect people. I mean, storm is low probability, but high impact. Mm -hmm. Add females lower mobility because of their lack of social, uh, you know, mobility plus also we know how rural women dress normally, which is not really helpful for their mobility. All these things together, if females need to reduce their risk uh, from exposure to storms, they need to spend more money because they cannot do all the things they need to do themselves. They need to hire some additional help. Altogether, although they are less affected by storms, when some storms happen, their recovery actually becomes more expensive. So that's uh, something uh, uh, th this equation actually asks. Although they are more affected by floods, they are spending more for storms. And this is the reason this uh, scenario is uh, happening. Very good. Thank yeah. you very much. We are. Um... Uh, coming to the end of our allotted time. So I'm not sure we'll be able to do all the questions. So let me invite uh, the speakers to feel free to type in your answers so that at least uh, each question gets somebody to answer it in written form. Um, but I'll take one or two more orally and, and invite speakers to answer as well. So please type in your answers as well as uh, answer the question when I ask you to. So the question, next question I'm going to take is from Vanita. And she says, uh, do we see the role of contamination of water resources due to the fast fashion enhancing the vulnerability of women? And if looking at the whole ecosystem in climate change can help at looking at alternative approaches, for example, extending the polluter pay principle uh, to be extended across the supply chain and not leave it to contractual garment industry suppliers at the local level. Uh, this disaster of contamination of source and death of rivers uh, builds slowly and enhances vulnerability of women. Very interesting question, uh, actually regarding pollution rather than uh, disasters, but it is a, a problem that we are facing in Bangladesh. Would anybody like to uh, take it up? Maliha, any thoughts? Anne, please go ahead. Thanks very much. Yeah, a, a key question there. Um, and it brings to mind some of the uh, questions around um, just transition as well and how we think about impacts on uh, workers and, um, uh, and, and the key question as well as, it, as we've kind of implicitly alluded to links between health and climate change. Um, and what we've seen uh, in the sorts of um, efforts that have been made around um, decarbonization include a whole range of um, industrial um, processes and, and energy efficiency and a, a real push to uh, help firms and industries um, um, improve their um, uh, environmental impact, but also their 
cleaner production processes um, that have this very uh, direct impact on um, environmental health, on workers' health um, and safety, um, and that whole linkage between kind of environmental and social audits. Um, and I think there was an earlier question too on, you know, what is um, the role for women's movements and political movements? And um, I've, uh, I know in the case of Bangladesh that um, there are quite a lot of uh, kind of unions and, and CSO um, alliances, et cetera, um, pushing particularly in, in, in the key um, sector of, of garments in Bangladesh um, uh, domestically and, and also sometimes with international support. And, um, and, and I think there's great scope for, for work to be done there. Um, so, uh, and this is a lot of what we're trying to do in, in um, the World Bank's uh, efforts in, in supporting countries um, um, in uh, transition, not just in terms of kind of energy sources and renewable energy sources, but the whole range of, of kind of production and consumption that um, has such an impact on people. So thank you, uh, thank you for that question. Thank you very much, Anne, for that excellent response. So I'm now going to um, put the final question to all the speakers and give you a minute each to give a quick uh, response. Um, the question comes from Melissa Bunkaras. I hope I pronounced that right. If you could change one thing about the current climate financing system to ensure it is more gender just, what would it be? I think that's a good challenge to uh, end with. I'll, I'll go in the order we started, uh, Sheikh first and then Anne and then Maliha and then I'll give the final word to Paul. Sheikh, please. One thing, what do you think? Uh, more more research, to... more research. <laughs> <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> uh, well, in addition to more research, increased access to formal banking, uh, loan for formal banking. So that, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Good. And what's the one thing you would think of? Um, I think we need lots of um, transparency and planning and budgeting and um, uh, you know, much more widespread participation um, uh, of a wider range of society. Um, it, it takes um, that innovation and, and identification of real needs on the ground, I think, to make the sort of difference where we're looking to have. Excellent. Yes. Thank you. Malia? One I thing. think, you know, yes, uh, women's voices and decision making are still very much lacking in, in, in this country context and in this region. So there is still a lot more work to be done to ensure that uh, we have more women, uh, you know, thinking about these problems and telling us about how we can help them. Excellent. Thank you. Paul, last word. Uh, thanks. Well, yeah, I mean, IID has been doing a lot of work with others on what we call money where it matters. So I think it's this point that many of the other colleagues have made about getting money to the local level. We had a question on that. And, and as we've heard, poor people, particularly women, are spending their own resources. They're not passive victims. They're investing in their own future. So we need to give them the resources to enable them to do that more effectively. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much, all our speakers, for some excellent discussions. Um, again, please feel free to put answers to questions that were not answered in the uh, Q&A box so that at least the askers of the questions can uh, get some responses from you. I'm going to um, conclude by sharing a little bit of my thinking that I, I'm going to uh, use the climate change world and the climate change jargon uh, to bear on this very uh, important issue that we've been discussing for the last hour. In the climate change arena, particularly the sixth assessment report of the IPCC has become a very, very important game-changing uh, report. It's the first time in 30 years that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change have actually reported Working Group 1, which uh, tracks climate changes and climate models for the very first time can verifiably attribute the impacts of climate change happening already because of the temperature increase that we've had already, which is over one degree centigrade. So climate change impacts are now a reality. They, they are absolutely attributable to human induced climate change. No question about that. And then a little later, we got the working group two report of the IPCC that uh, is on vulnerability impacts and adaptation. And they had chapter and verse, hundreds of examples of impacts actually happening 
people suffering from floods, hikes on fire, sea level rise, salinity intrusion, what have you, all the different impacts of climate change that were predicted in the past are now actually happening. So people are suffering. People are suffering losses and damages as we speak. And this in fact leads to the third assessment report giving us a very, very short time window to get our house in order to stay below 1.5 degrees. We have to start acting now and we have to deal with the losses and damages uh, from human induced climate change as a reality in every country, whatever the global system, the COP, the UNFCC decide or don't decide or fail to decide, the reality on the ground is it's happening. And as you know, right now here in this part of the world uh, in Bangladesh, we, we are suffering quite a hot day, uh, but it's nowhere near what is happening at the uh, in India and in Pakistan, where the temperature has gone above 50 degrees already, uh, and people are dying. And that is a reality. That is what we have to deal with. And particularly uh, women are uh, particularly vulnerable. And, and uh, to be uh, a more optimistic note, people are not sitting idle. People are working. And Bangladesh is what at the forefront of trying to devise ways of dealing with it from the bottom up, people individually on their own at the household level, at the school level, at the community level, and also at the national level and uh, linking up with global institutions like the UN and the World Bank. And Bangladesh is really literally, literally a laboratory for tackling climate change. You name a problem, we have it, and we are doing something about it. Somebody somewhere in Bangladesh is doing something about every single problem that we are everybody's going to face eventually, but we are facing today. And so um, as researchers, it's a, a very great place to work. I, I hope that Paul and uh, Iskander are planning a next phase of your work. Uh, very happy to engage with you to make sure that we do some good uh, proper research uh, that can feed into decision-making. And on the decision-making side, just to mention that in Bangladesh right now, several things were uh, um, pointing out Bangladesh is developing its national adaptation plan. It's already developed its national nationally determined contribution plan. It's also preparing something called the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, which is something fairly unique in which gender and, and women is going to be focused as well as locally led adaptation is going to be extremely uh, well focused. And that's something that we bring together. And, and the whole approach is going to be a whole of society approach, not just leaving to uh, particular agencies of the government, but all the government agencies, as well as non-governmental actors, NGOs, and our development partners as well. It, it, there's a huge opportunity for collaborative work, for learning from each other, sharing with each other, and adding uh, to each other's uh, uh, abilities to be effective. Um, the last point I'll make is, again, citing the Working Group 2 report of the IPCC, which actually did quite a lot of analysis on existing adaptation uh, funding and uh, projects. And quite surprisingly, in my view, uh, came up with a very um, odd finding. Firstly, many of these interventions did not add value. They didn't work. Some of them actually did the reverse. They made things worse. They were maladaptive rather than adaptive. And so we don't really know what is effective adaptation. We are going up a learning curve and we have to admit mistakes when we make them and correct them. And so this is an, a, a, a lesson for everybody involved in either funding or supporting or implementing adaptation. We need to learn by doing and we need to be much more, more aware of our ineffectiveness and correct our ineffectiveness and make it more effective. And this goes for the, the World Banks and the UN agencies as well. Nobody knows all the answers. We need to be humble in our approach to doing things and learning by doing. With that, I'm going to close uh, this uh, meeting. Thank everybody for being with us. Uh, I hope uh, we can give everybody a, a, an appropriate uh, thumbs up or a hand or a wave or whatever it is that would help uh, and wish everybody a, rest of, a good rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much.